Do you remember the first tabletop game you've played in your life? And is there anything from this game uh, which stayed in you as an inspiration for your future project? Well, the first tabletop game I probably played was Shoots and Ladders or, you know, Parcheesi or something. So I don't know if that qualifies. Uh, the first hobby game I played uh, might have been Ogre from Steve Jackson Games. Uh, and I don't know that that's influenced me much uh, as a developer, but uh, I ended up getting a job at Steve Jackson Games, so I guess it, it set me up on, on my career path. Uh, so it, it had some influence, yeah. You've said today that for game developers it is, it is necessary to find some mentors. Uh, who inspires you? Oh, I've, I've been so lucky. I, I haven't just found people who inspired me uh, and whose work resonates with me. I, I've, I've actually been able to work with all of my mentors. Uh, the first one was Steve Jackson. Um, not the one who did the, the Choose Your Own Adventure books. That's, that's a different Steve Jackson than the one I worked for. Um, but Steve taught me uh, a ton about design, about flowcharting single player adventures, and um, you know, how to you know, in, involve players uh, at a deep and meaningful level through play. And uh, he, he did a lot for me. Um, and then uh, a little bit later on, uh, I got to work with Richard Garriott, uh, who, who's best known for the Ultima games. And uh, I, I think of that as, you know, if Steve was my, my undergraduate education in game design, uh, Richard was my graduate degree. Uh, he, he taught me uh, a ton. I mean, uh, notably that there were significant differences between tabletop games and, and uh, digital games, even though there are some similarities, obviously, and, and there are things that, that do or, or can be uh, carried over. Um, Richard taught me about the differences, uh, and, and that was a really powerful lesson. Could you please uh, more evaluate uh, uh, about differences, about, uh, I mean, like in tabletop games and, and video games? There are a lot of differences between uh, tabletop and digital games. Um, notably, uh, in tabletop games, uh, players, players are free to create content. Uh, in role-playing games, they, they continually confound their game master. It's, you know, half the fun is doing something that puts the game master on the spot, having to make something up on the fly to, to deal with what players uh, want to do. Uh, I've been trying to get that into digital games for a long time, but haven't quite succeeded yet. Uh, so there's, there's that difference, you know, that players are, can be more involved in the creative process than in tabletop than in digital games. The other one is, um, I think of, of uh, digital games as, as a, a very uh, literal medium. Like if, if you don't include it as a developer, if you don't put something in the game, it, it can't happen. <laughs> and uh, in, in a, the tabletop world, you can leave out critical combat tables, you can have a rule that doesn't work, you can have sentences that are just completely eliminated from the rules, and players will still find a way to make it work. Uh, in a digital game, the game just crashes. You know, I've seen, I've seen games broken because there was one text letter, one letter left out of a line of code. I mean, it's a very, very literal medium uh, on the digital side. Have you ever had in your in your head uh, some great idea, a great thought about some dream video game, and then you realize that you are not able to do the game because of the technology or any other barrier? I have so many ideas that the the uh, you know the the state of the art won't allow us to make yet. Um, I, I've I've always wanted to do a, what I call the one block role playing game, where we we just take one city block and simulate everything. <laughs> you know, every character has a story, every object is interactive. Uh, we tell a thousand stories just on one city block. Um, and no one's been foolish enough to give me the money to try to make that, and I have no idea how to make it work. Um, but that's, that's a dream that's out there somewhere. Um, but it happens all the time. I mean, uh, on every game, 
you you know I always try to do something that no one's done before uh, because it's just funny to try it not funny it's, it's often not funny uh, but it's fun to try to do things you don't know how to do uh, and sometimes they don't work out you know either the time isn't right the uh, the state of, of the, the technology isn't right uh, or you know something just doesn't work and uh, you encounter that on every project. It's not just something that happens once in a while. It's every single project. During your session today, you said that uh, in uh, some you know, like time, uh, you have to avoid this kind of uh, this kind of uh, idea or something. How difficult it is to to completely you know like uh, turn off from from something very cool. I, uh, you know, I I was talking to uh, uh, another designer here at. Uh, at uh, Reboot and he was talking about how he has a game system that he loves. He is absolutely in love with it and he it's not fitting, it's not working in his game and he can't bear to cut it. And I just looked at him and said, cut it, cut it now. You know, it's it doesn't matter how cool the idea is, if it, if it doesn't work, it has to go. Um, How do I feel about it? You know, it's always hard, but um, you know, on, on Deus Ex, I came up with a skill system that I thought was incredibly cool and was going to be really fun. And you know, we we got it implemented in prototype form and tried it, and it boy, did it not work. <laughs> um, and uh, pretty much the next day, Harvey Smith, my lead designer, came in with a completely different proposal for a skill system. And I just looked at it and looked at him and said, "Oh." Yeah, <laughs> that's better than mine. Uh, so you just have to you have to live with it. Um, it's a, a part of uh, the creative process that you come up with stuff. It doesn't work, you cut it. According to you, um, what's the biggest differences in video games and making video games? If you compare days you became a developer and nowadays, is it the technology more or the way we tell stories or you tell stories? Um, almost everything is different in, in, between uh, the time I started and, and today in, in some sense. Um, we have simulation tools that we, we just couldn't even dream of. Uh, when I started, uh, our color palette was green. That's it. You know, We were thrilled when we got 16 colors uh, and 256, oh my gosh. Uh, I remember when, uh, when we f saw the first CD, CD-ROM at Origin, we, we held it up. It was like, you know, the apes in 2001, you know, worshiping the monolith. We just held it up and looked at it and said, no one will ever fill one of these. And of course now, that's a silly thing to have said. Um, so hardware has changed dramatically, um, but uh, the... From a, from a, I was going to say from a design standpoint, but from a desire standpoint, nothing's changed. I'm still trying to do the same thing I was trying to do, which is, you know, empower players to tell their own stories, uh, or engage in a dialogue with me uh, as we tell stories together. So in that sense, nothing has changed, and uh, the design philosophy is, is still the same. Um, The other thing that's changed, obviously, is team size and uh, and budget. Um, you know, when I started, uh, I mean, I, I was I was kind of third generation developer, to be clear. Uh, you know, I wasn't I was never the one person alone making a game guy. But when I started, a, a big team was 10 people, um, and so communication was pretty easy, and uh, maintaining a consistent vision was pretty easy. And my last project, Epic Mickey, The Power of Two, I had 800 people working on it. 200 internally and 617 locations around the world. I think I had as many producers on that project as I have people making System Shock 3 now. Uh, so certainly team size and budget and communication problems and the need for structure, uh, all of that has changed completely. The, the, the methods of development have changed completely. And, Not always for the better. Is it easier to do game to make games nowadays or back then? Well, with 2020 hindsight, it, it was hard to make them back then. We always thought, 
Uh, it was insanely hard. And I used to talk to movie guys and say, you know, what we do is so much harder than what you do. Uh, and um, it's just way harder now. <laughs> uh, player expectations are so high uh, and teams are getting to be so big. Uh, it's just, it's a whole different world and, and making games is much harder now than it used to be. We are really interested in uh, Epic Mickey uh, and my first question about this topic is how did you get involved with uh, Disney? Uh, how I got involved with Disney is kind of an interesting story, well interesting to me anyway. Um, I was uh, I was out uh, I just done a startup. I'd started Junction Point, and I was out pitching every publisher I could think of uh, on an epic fantasy role playing game called Sleeping Giants, and a project I was working on with John Wu called uh, Ninja Gold, and a modern well, a near future science fiction game uh, called Necessary Evil, which was basically Deus Ex with the serial numbers filed off. Um, and uh, my agent, I had an agent at the time, uh, said, we should go talk to Disney. And I just looked at him and said, Disney's not going to be interested in these, you know, M-rated games. They're just, it's not what they do. And he said, oh, let's talk to them anyway. So to make a long story short, I, uh, I went in, I pitched them on Sleeping Giants, Ninja Gold, and Necessary Evil. And sure enough, they weren't interested. And in fact, I saw all these executives in the room. They were looking down at their, at their phones and tapping away. And it looked like they were just texting people. And I was really mad because I knew that was what was going to happen. But it turned out that what they were doing was texting each other uh, and asking if they should pitch me on the idea of doing a Mickey Mouse game. And, and that's what they did. Basically, they asked me if I, I would be interested in doing a, a licensed Disney game. And I told him, yeah, give me, give me the ducks. Give me Scrooge and Donald and the nephews. And, uh, or uh, give me uh, Night Stalker, which was an ABC television show at the time. Uh, and Disney owned ABC. Um, you know, basically it was the monster of the week. And I've always wanted to do that kind of game too. Uh, and they said, well, what about Mickey Mouse? And I just said, who, who would say no to working with the most recognizable icon on planet Earth. And then they said, well, and they were kind of sheepish about it. You know, it's like, well, we have, we have an idea. Do you mind if we pitch it to you? And they're going, Disney is asking if they can pitch me on a title. And I said, sure. And they showed me this, this PowerPoint presentation and it was genius. It was absolute genius. Um, and uh, they said, you don't have to do any of this. You don't have to take any of this. And I just looked at him and I said, you just gave me an acorn. You gave me a seed. You didn't give me a full game. I'm going to grow that acorn into an oak tree. And uh, I, I had to do it. Uh, so there were still some elements of, of that original proposal. Uh, a bunch of interns came up with it. Uh, and some elements made it all the way to the end. A lot of it was new and original with me and the team, but uh, that proposal was genius and I was thrilled to use it as a foundation for what we did. Is it true that uh, some of your colleagues left your studio when you told them your next project will be Epic Mickey? It's absolutely true that I lost some resources when, uh, when I came back to the studio and said, we're not making uh, an epic fantasy role-playing game, a modern-day ninja game, or a near-future science fiction game. We're making a Mickey Mouse game. Uh, I, I really did lose my best uh, level designer uh, and my lead writer. Um, but, you know, my, my level designer came to me and said, I make shooters. It's what I love. It's what I do. And my writer came to me and said, I don't think I can find that Disney voice. I don't, I don't have that in my skill set. And uh, so them leaving was the right thing to do. You know, we stayed friends. Um, and uh, the, the project uh, and they uh, benefited from it. I think some of your hardcore fans were also very, very surprised when you announced the project in 2009. Did you feel any concerns, fears or pressure about their reactions to the new game? I certainly took a lot of, uh, well, I got a lot of grief, let's just put it that way. Uh, from, from a lot of fans about doing a Mickey Mouse game. I heard the words sell out a lot. Um, 
did I feel pressured by that? No, not really. Um, you know, I, I have a particular philosophy of design and, and a, a thing I think is important. I mean, empowering players and creating unique experiences, them creating unique experiences is, is what I really care about and um, asking players to grapple with, with big questions. And I knew I could do all of that in the context of a Mickey Mouse game. Uh, and in fact, I thought I could kind of sneak that philosophy in uh, into a game like Epic Mickey and attract a much larger audience with it, expose normal human beings to the idea of, uh, of immersive simulation and shared authorship uh, because I had Mickey Mouse. He was like my secret weapon. And it worked out. Uh, Epic Mickey was by far the best selling game I've ever worked on uh, and people got it. A lot of hardcore gamers didn't. A lot of hardcore gamers still to this day don't see that under the surface, if you can get past the content, the, the Epic Mickey is the same as Deus Ex. <laughs> uh, but, and that saddens me, but uh, no, I didn't feel any pressure. I, I knew what I wanted to do uh, and I did it. Is there any uh, one particular thing in uh, Epic Mickey you like the most and maybe not anyone, uh, sorry, not everyone uh, got it? Um, well, I think people mostly got it. Uh, the thing I love the most about Epic Mickey is um, I insisted that the team be um, completely faithful to Disney history. Nothing went in the game uh, unless they could point to real world uh, Disney reference. Uh, and what happened uh, is, uh, and it's true to this day, uh, Disney fans really embraced us. Uh, the hardcore gamers, maybe not so much, but uh, Disney fans loved the game. Uh, and uh, I, that means a lot to me. Uh, you know, we respected the source material, uh, which is critical when you're doing any kind of uh, licensed game, you know, working with an existing uh, intellectual property. Uh, we were true to it, we respected it. I think people at Disney saw that and Disney fans saw it, so I'm really happy about that. But in addition, the other thing that kills me, I, I, I will probably start crying when I talk about this, um, the response I got to the game from fans was overwhelming. Um, there was one, one thing in particular, well, I got, I've got a million stories like this, but one, uh, I got um, a package in the mail and I opened it up and um, a, an illustration, colored pencil illustration, fell out of this envelope. And it, it was uh, Mickey Mouse and Oswald the Lucky Rabbit with their arms around each other, legs dangling off a cliff, starry sky up above. And uh, it, was, it was this sort of testament to, the, to brotherly love, you know? And then I looked at the letter that came with it, and my hair is standing on end right now. I looked at the letter that came with it, and it was from uh, a father who said, my 16-year-old autistic daughter doesn't, doesn't engage with the world typically, but she was totally entranced by your game and, and did this drawing and insisted that I send it to you. Um, you know, screw Metacritic. That, that means a lot when you can touch people at that level. Uh, review scores, who cares? Why have you decided to do Epic Mickey as the exclusive? Because I believe it was meant to be at first Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 game? Yeah, that was purely a business decision to, to go as a Wii exclusive. Um, I, I wasn't too much involved in that. Uh, I, assume, I assume they gave Disney some money. I, I don't know. Um, but uh, it was the right decision. Uh, once we once we've you know, settled on the, the uh, paint and thinner, the drawing and erasing mechanic, uh, having a, a Wii remote in your hand uh, was pretty much the right answer. Uh, so it was, a, it was a great decision. And I, I absolutely loved working with Nintendo. I can't tell you, I, I, would, I would love to work with Nintendo again. They were great to me and, and the perfect partner. Now uh, you are the part of the uh, other side team. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you please describe uh, more uh, the foundation of the team back in 2016, I guess? Uh, other side is, uh, is a, a, well, we're no longer a startup. We've been around for 
uh, about three years now. Uh, and it's, um, you know, Paul Nurath, who was the founder of Blue Sky, which became Looking Glass, uh, it w really got it started. Um, and uh, he and I had worked together on several projects, many, many projects. Uh, so we knew each other real well. And he asked me if I would be an advisor to the company. And on, on that basis, I went out with him on a bunch of fundraising tours and, you know, had a bunch of meetings and gave him feedback on what he was thinking about doing with the company. And one day, uh, I, we were on a fundraising tour and he looked at me and said, I got the rights back to System Shock. And I, I half jokingly said, you know, I should make that for you. <laughs> and he, he called me back a, a while later and said, you know, you should make that for me. And so I joined him as a, as a full partner uh, and we, uh, we run the company. He's the CEO and handles uh, the business stuff and happily I don't have to think about that. Um, I, I get to run my own studio in Austin, Texas. We, I have my own team, I have my own project uh, and uh, it's working out great. So uh, we are a company of two studios, one in Boston, one in Austin. Uh, we, he has about 20 people up there. I have about 20 people, uh, in my studio and, um, you know, we talk all the time and I get feedback from him on System Shock and I give them feedback on their projects and, uh, it's working out pretty well so far. You're famous for games with choices and consequences. Would you be ever interested in making game without those things, without choices and consequences? Every once in a while, I especially towards the end of a project, I just bang my head on my desk and go, why do I always do things the hard way? <laughs> and it might be nice as a palate cleanser, you know, just as a change of pace to do something simple, just make a shooter for crying out loud, you know, or, or do a puzzle game. Um, I've always wanted to make a basketball game, but no one's been stupid enough to give me the money to do that. You know, that's for sure. Um, but for the most part, uh, I'm, I'm the choice and consequence guy all the way. Uh, and if, if it ever comes to the point where I can't make that kind of game, uh, I'm going to stop making games. Okay, so maybe last question, what's uh, on your horizon uh, now, maybe after System Shock or everything is now System Shock 3? What's on the horizon after System Shock 3? Well, we're, we're certainly thinking about uh, how we keep people engaged in that world and with our stories and our characters. So I think it's safe to say you'll see some downloadable content. Surprise, surprise. And, um, you know, we're already thinking about System Shock 4. Um, I would like to get back to creating original IP. I like creating worlds uh, and original characters. So uh, I suspect you'll see some of that as well. But uh, we'll see what happens. First thing is System Shock 3. Let's get that out of the door.